So today we welcome David Kippen, who was born and raised in Southern California, including four years here in Palm Springs. Former literature director of the National Endowment of Arts, book editor and critic for the San Francisco Chronicle, and contributor to the multi-volumes of California cultural history. David currently teaches full-time at UCLA for the writing program. A familiar voice on public radio, he also serves as book critic for the Los Angeles Magazine and critic at large for the Los Angeles Times. While serving as director of the Literature and National Reading Initiatives at the National Endowment of Arts, he helped develop and ran the Big Read. This nationwide initiative is to promote reading via one city, one book program, which it is entering its ninth year. With over a thousand cities and towns, including ours. Thank you, David, for your vision and implementation of such a wonderful program. I was gonna tell you that David would be signing books afterwards, but I believe everybody that was able to get a book had it signed before. So again, uh, I wanna welcome you all and welcome David Kipp. Thank oh, that's Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Ooh, and I was gonna steal a book, and there you've left it for me. Ah, you would think I would have enough of these, but I haven't written enough books, obviously, because I absolutely cherish it. But um, first of all, welcome. My hand is very tired. Um, ooh. Um, but I actually kind of love the way this has worked out because it feels as if we've already gotten to know each other a little bit. And that will, I think, I hope, uh, promote a certain collegiality this afternoon. I would love this to be a conversation as much as possible. So nobody has to worry about being thought rude for raising their hand even before the Q&A, which we will be getting around to afterward. Um, let me start by saying thank you. Thank you to the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival, which I had the great good fortune to attend the um, Expando version of a few weeks ago. And I am staggered by its quality and care and thoroughgoing enjoyability. And for that, we have Jamie Kabler and his whole team to thank. So please give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Um, let me ask, start by asking a question. Um, how many of you are from Earth? <laughs> a few, here and there, okay. How many of you are from the United States? Okay. Um, how many of you are from California? Wow, is anybody putting their hands down as we go through this little litany? Um, are any of you from Los Angeles? Will you look at that? Um, are any of you from the Coachella Valley? Well, okay. <laughs> I think I saw a couple of hands sort of cross-listing out there. Um, anybody go to Kawea Elementary School? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Seriously, I was there. Boy, between the third and the sixth grades, which means probably between 1969 and 72-ish. So anybody who wants to come up and say hi afterward, whom I probably already said hi to beforehand, I would love to kick around old times if I can think of any of them that I remember. Um, I am so thrilled to be here with you. Let me give you an idea of how today is going to go. Um, I'm going to start talking, oh yeah, I already did that. I'm going to um, tell you a little about my book. I'm going to read a little bit from my book, but not too much because I've sat where you're sitting and people's tolerance level for listening to other people read from their books is not unlimited. Um, and then I'm going to talk you through a little bit of it that might give you a better idea of how it works because it doesn't work completely intuitively. Um, and then I might come back and read a little more just because I can't help myself. Um, this is a book about my hometown. Um, I was born in Los Angeles in 1963 um, in a hospital that is now painted blue and owned by the Church of Scientology. <laughs> 
I grew up there until I was six years old, at which point um, my father died, my brother moved away, went to Berkeley, and it was time for my mom, for reasons that were very perplexing to me as a six-year-old, to move to Palm Springs. Um, we lasted four years, um, and then we went back to Los Angeles, which I took totally for granted. Um, people, I've met them, I married one, grew up far away, and dreamt of Los Angeles their whole lives, totally took it for granted. Saw nothing exotic about it. We would go to San Francisco for a few weeks in the summer, and I just thought it was the most exotic place imaginable. I graduated from high school and couldn't wait to go to college on the other side of the country. Um, and then a funny thing happened, and I'm not the only person this ever happened to. I talk to more and more people who say the same thing. I got there freshman year, and I missed something, and I didn't know what it was. I felt homesickness for a place that had never felt particularly like home before. And I read a little Raymond Chandler, which helped. I listened to a little Tom Waits, which also helped. And before I knew it, after I graduated, there was no place I wanted to be except L.A. And... Then I became the book critic, well, I, flashing forward a mere 10 or 15 years, um, I went to work for the San Francisco Chronicle as their book critic. And so at that point, I became this much less of an Angelino and this much more of a Californian. But I was still so homesick for Southern California that, in fact, um, of the seven years I worked for the San Francisco Chronicle, I spent six of them, unbeknownst to my editors at the newspaper, in a mobile home in Malibu. <laughs> I was one of the very first telecommuters, and certainly one of the very first secret telecommuters. Um, and eventually, through a roundabout process I won't belabor, um, went to Washington to, yes, as your wonderful librarian Aaron Espinosa suggested, midwife this program called The Big Read, where you get everybody in one town to read the same book at the same time, and it's beautiful. If you haven't participated yet, the program is still going strong, including, as Aaron said, here. And um, this hasn't been anybody's one city, one book book yet, but standing here in a room full of exactly 100 of you, near as I can tell, because that's how many books there were, um, I am absolutely thrilled. I feel like I'm in the middle of my own big read for the first time in my life. Um, that's the book. It's an odd one. Um, it is, as the title implies, The City and Diaries and Letters from 1542 to 2018. But it's not chronological. Um, I figured out pretty early that might not quite work. And maybe now's a good time to start reading a bit from the introduction, because it sort of kind of explains that. This book is a collective self-portrait of Los Angeles when it thought nobody was looking. Joyous, creative, life-giving, violent, stupid, inhospitable to strangers, cerebral, melancholy, funny. And I'm skipping because I'm a good public speaker and I have your best interests at heart. Um, a reader's first reaction to Dear Los Angeles might be, what's with the hiccuping date-by-date -date structure? And those of you who've already dipped into the book know what I mean. It does not start in 1542. It starts on January 1st. And in fact, I can tell you how it starts on January 1st. You could look for yourselves, but it's kind of dark in here, and I like to hear myself read. Um, it starts with these words, which were not chosen by accident. January 1st, 1853, I have not yet seen a gold mine. <laughs> this was written by a guy named Judge Benjamin Hayes, who was one of countless people I did not know from Adam when I started this book, and I've sort of kind of fallen in love with. There are so many people, and by the way, lest you think I'm lazy, um, yes, this book is full of other people's words. Um, their diaries, their letters, their observations of Los Angeles, none of which were really intended for publication at the time. Um, but I did write the introduction, you're hearing me now. 
uh, read from. I did write the acknowledgments, and I wrote like 50, 60 pages of biographies in back, just sort of capsule thumbnail biographies, so you know that Judge Benjamin Hayes is the amazing guy who rode here on a burrow with his law books in his saddlebags and wound up freeing a woman named Biddy Mason, a slave, um, rather than sending her back east where her master was. Um, remarkable stories, every one of them. So it begins with Benjamin Hayes wondering where all the gold mines are in Los Angeles, and then it sort of leapfrogs forward all the way to 1923, where you get Sister Amy Semple McPherson. Anybody know who that is? You do know who Sister Amy Mc Semple McPherson is. Um, an evangelist, uh, kind of a larger than life, not altogether honest preacher in Echo Park, where her church still stands. Um, and she had a diary entry from January 1st, so we hear from her. Then we skip ahead to 1934, a woman I know nothing about. This is one of the shortest capsule biographies in the back. Her name is Grandmother McGrema. I've been traipsing around through uh, archives and libraries for years, so that's where I find some of these rather offbeat, off the beaten path um, names that you'll be hearing. Um, and she wrote this in 1934, which is an amazing year in L.A. history. Had awful flood in La Crescenta and Montrose. Many killed and injured and many homes washed away. Rained all day. Stayed home and quilted. <laughs> the idea of these things coexisting on the same day, in the same place, a few years before Los Angeles had to brick up its whole river um, because it wouldn't stay within its banks, just blows my mind. And I'm starting to kind of gather, as I'd hoped, that it may blow other people's too. The idea that such a panoply, such a variety, such a plethora of experience can coexist, whether in the same place, on the same day, or both. And it gives a kind of cockeyed picture of the city. And so I'll just, I'll, I'll dash back to the introduction so that you can hear a little bit more of what I had in mind. Aha. Apart from how it's organized and how letters crash the diary party, because you see, this follows on another book that was all diaries. I didn't think that was enough. I wanted to throw in letters because you get a different perspective. Apart from that, a last unavoidable question to address here is what got in and what didn't. You could spend a lifetime in libraries and archives, and sometimes that's what it felt like. It's been seven years, and barely scratch the surface of what's available. The only constraints are publisher patience and authorial liquidity. Within these parameters, my criteria for including an entry were basically, one, relevance to Los Angeles, and two, indefensible, indefinable editorial prerogative. Mostly I liked these entries because they told me something about my city. For reasons hard to quantify, they played off each other in quirky, quarky, covalent ways. Some underscored how far we've come, others how far we still have to go. Ultimately, the entries had a hard time getting in if they didn't make me laugh, or tick me off, or choke me up. Okay, now's the time to shut up and let hundreds of my neighbors get a word in, and I'm going to start showing you a couple of them. The quick and the dead alike, the habitues and the just passing through. Los Angeles is a mountain lion that we only glimpse in shutter-quick flashes. A strong diary entry or letter makes as good a tripwire as, anyway, as any. Way back when, for a lark, Angelinos used to plant now entering Los Angeles city limit signs in faraway places and pose next to them for pictures. You remember these? LA is so big, so went the joke, that you could trek to the Himalayas and still you'd never escape the place. L.A. had no city limits, but the joke cracks both ways. A driver only sees an entering Los Angeles sign on the way into town, never the way out. Looked at this way, 
L.A. is the place that Angelinos are forever approaching, but can never quite get to. Like the city's most salient, saleable feature, the sun, you can't look directly at it. On the right day, though, over the shoulder of a frank letter writer or diarist, you can feel its radiance. Yes, Los Angeles, that's the end of the introduction. Yes, Los Angeles is dear to me. The title Dear Los Angeles came to me when I decided to put in letters, and the only thing that diaries and letters have in common, at least verbally, is that you start them both with dear. Although some of you, I think, in your inscriptions probably have seen me start with something else. Inscriptions, actually, maybe for the second edition. It'll be diaries and letters and inscriptions. Um, but for now, yes, this book is called Dear Los Angeles because my hometown, for all its foibles, for all the blood it has on its hands, is very dear to me. And so now um, I want to take you through just a little bit of it so that you can get a taste of um, what it's meant to me. And I, 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 hope you, I hope this is okay. I have tailored this just a little bit to where we are today. The Coachella Valley is also very dear to me, as I told you. I spent time growing up here, or not growing up here, or postponing growing up here. And um, so when I show you this, oh right, that's our title. The City and Diaries and Letters from 1542 to 2018, and if you count today, 2019. I want to show you this fellow. Love that picture. I'll just wait here a moment while you tell me who it is. Any guesses? You, you can only be wrong. Louis B. Mayer? Not fat enough to be Louis B. Mayer. And Louis B. Mayer got other people to do his typing for him. George Gershwin. Um, another good guess. Um, but this, I think, was just a year or two before, tragically, George Gershwin died. Since you bring him up, his brother Ira's letter to his mother after George died is, at least in part, in here. It's such fun to talk with people about Los Angeles and say either, oh no, I left him out, or on good days, yes, they're in here. Sad or happy, they're in here. I know I can't catch up all of Los Angeles in here. And that's what the second edition is for. That's what the Q&A is for afterward. I mean, it's for anything you want to talk about, but certainly calling me on my omissions is fair game. Um, but I will give you a clue about who you're looking at here. Screenwriter? You would think so. And because I myself am a writer, I wrote a whole book about screenwriters called... Uh, called not Dear Screenwriter, um, uh, um, uh, The Schreiber Theory, a radical rewrite of American film history. Each book tends to supersede the last, and you know the old ones just sort of evaporate, at least when they're out of print, which sadly that one is. Um, this was, here are your clues, sing out. Aaron Copeland, there you go. That was Aaron Copeland typing, unless there were notes on his keyboard. I assume he's not composing. I assume he's writing a letter because he wrote letters, including this one. It's a letter to Bernstein. February 21st, 1943. Wish you could have seen us playing the international... You know what the international is? The national anthem of the international workers of the world. Wish you could have seen us playing the international to him in Samuel Goldwyn's office. He said, it's a steering tune, by which I assume he meant a stirring tune. You deserve some kind of medal. Talking to Leonard Bernstein, who'd had his own adventures with Samuel Goldwyn. But I'd rather wait until I can pin it on myself. P.S. Just heard the Stravinsky Symphony on the air. This is another reason why I wanted to put this book together. Um, L.A. gets a bum rap for not having much A, history, or B, culture. And those are A, ridiculous, and B, preposterous, respectively. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I also wanted to put this book together. Um, there are fascinating people here, some of whom we've heard of and revere, like Aaron Copeland and, in fact, Leonard Bernstein. And, of course, these years, the 30s and the 40s, when everybody came out to put words in silent movie actors' mouths and 
drew on their histories as playwrights and newspapermen to make some of the most wonderful, funniest, talkiest, and fast-cracking movies ever made. It was all I could do to keep the book from having an enormous bulge in it. I mean, frankly, that's another reason, maybe the best reason, why the book hopscotches around, why each day recapitulates as best I can a lot of the history of Los Angeles. Because left to my own devices, putting the book in absolutely chronological order, it'd be 150 pages before you recognized anybody. Now, <laughs> I don't mean to insult you. Probably there are some fans of LA history out there. At least I hope so. I was kind of one, and now I am so obnoxiously one that if anybody asks me any questions about L.A. history, I will either fake it or talk your ear off all afternoon. Um, but this is an example, not the best example, but certainly the most desert-specific example um, with a little competition, and maybe I'll read you some competition. Anybody who wants to guess whose words we're hearing now, by all means, sing out. This is from March the 8th, 1941. And there's a Palm Springs reference at the end. I do not yet know all the possibilities of Hollywood because it's a place where you never see anyone. We live in a very pretty house with a rather large garden built on a hill which overlooks the whole city. It is in Hollywood which, it seems, is not very elegant at all. The high-class people live in Beverly Hills or further west toward the sea. The most expensive villas are in Santa Monica. The streets here are very long. For example, we live at 8150 Hollywood Boulevard. And before you reach us, on our side of the street, there really are 8,148 houses. At the very end of this little area, which is the intersection of Laurel Canyon and Sunset Boulevard, is Schwab's Drugstore. Anybody out there ever had a soda in Schwab's Drugstore? <laughs> I love being in this room. Um, one finds everything there, even medicine. They sell cigarettes, bras, newspapers, fountain pens, lingerie, sweets, dishes, wine, and alcohol. There's a huge counter where they serve you strange food. I will not tell you much about the food because I want you to be surprised. Americans, I love this. Americans cook like little girls playing with their toy plates, making themselves dishes with whatever they can steal from their mother's kitchens. Raw carrots, a piece of chocolate, leftover cauliflower, and some currant jelly. A few hours from here is a desert as beautiful as the Sahara. That's Palm Springs. That's also Jean Renoir the French filmmaker of The Rules of the Game and Grand Illusion, when he was exiled, as so many of the best, most fascinating writers to read about here were from the Nazis in Europe. Um, and to give you a taste of some of the sim simultaneity, um, the idea not just of single fascinating diary entries, or at least fascinating me, because it's a totally idiosyncratic book. I don't pretend what's fascinating to me has to be fascinating to you. But let's just look at a couple of the juxtapositions um, that crop up here. Um, let me show you another face. Anybody recognize that guy? Nobody shouted it out. Good, because it's obvious. All right. Um, but before we get to him in 1981, we get this from Nunnally Johnson. Anybody know who Nunnally Johnson is? Yes, he was a screenwriter, wrote and directed a wonderful adaptation of John, of, of, um, sorry, wrote the adaptation of uh, Grapes of Wrath, which John Ford directed. Had a long, terrific uh, writing and producing career, which you would think from the quality of the movies was very happy, but in fact, if you read his letters, he was miserable most of the time. In fact, he sends this letter um, on September 4th, the traditional birthday of Los Angeles in 1781. He sends this to Fred Allen, who I bet more people in this room have heard of than any other room I will ever talk to. <laughs> Great radio comedian. He says, the people here treat writers like boot blacks. Probably more people in this room know what a boot black is, too. It's a shoeshine boy. Uh, worse. That was 1954, and then you jump ahead to 1981, 
and you hear from this man. Writing in his diary, September the 4th, 1981. Not a big day. Met with Al Haig. The world is still exploding. The French ambassador to Beirut was gunned down by terrorists doing the Syrians' work. Met with Jim Watt. He's taking a lot of abuse from environmental extremists, but he's absolutely right. People are ecology too, and they can't forage for food and live in caves. Saw a film on Menachem Begin, kind of a character study. He'll be here Wednesday. And then, had a pleasant evening with a stack of horse and western magazines. A full day for President Reagan. The world's exploding, um, meeting with his cabinet, and who wouldn't want to end a day like that with horse and western magazines? Um, on the birthday of Los Angeles. Um, I love that picture. Um, let me actually take you to another photograph, which you might get a kick out of. Can you get them both? Winston Churchill and Charlie Chaplin. Did you know that Winston Churchill visited Southern California? I did, till I started my research. Here is Churchill's diary from his visit in 1929. We are traveling across the California desert. You hearing a theme here, desert? I don't have the electronic book version, but I sure do have my word file. We're traveling across the California desert in Mr. Schwab's railway car, and we have stopped for two hours at this oasis. We have left the train for a bath in the hotel, and as it is so nice and cool, I will write you a few of the things it is wiser not to dictate. Hearst, we can assume William Randolph Hearst. Hearst was most interesting to meet, and I got to like him. A grave, simple child, with no doubt a nasty temper, playing with the most costly toys, a vast income always overspent. Ceaseless buildings and collecting and not very discriminatingly works of art. Two magnificent establishments, two charming wives, complete indifference to public opinion, a strong liberal and democratic outlook, that didn't last, a 15 million daily circulation, oriental hospitalities, extreme personal courtesy to us at any rate. At Los Angeles, and I know this because in the diary entry it actually says hard G. At Los Angeles, we passed into the domain of Marion Davies and all were charmed by her. This was William Randolph Hearst's mistress, the actress. She is not strikingly beautiful nor impressive in any way, but her personality is most attractive, naive, childlike. She works all day at her films and retires to her palace on the ocean to bathe and entertain in the evenings. She asked us to use her house as if it was our own. But we tasted its comforts and luxuries only sparingly, spending two nights there after enormous dinner parties in our honor. We lunched frequently at her bungalow in the film works, a little Italian chapel sort of building, very elegant, where Hearst spends the day directing his newspapers on the telephone and wrestling with his private chancellor of the exchequer. We made great friends with Charlie Chaplin. You could not help liking him. The boys, he's got his sons traveling with him, the boys were fascinated by him. He's a marvelous comedian. Bolshe in politics, that would be Bolshevik, delightful in conversation. He acted his new film for us in a wonderful way. It is to be his great attempt to prove that the silent drama or pantomime is superior to the new talkies. Certainly, if pathos and wit still count for anything, it ought to win an easy victory. We went on Sunday in a yacht to Catalina Island, 25 miles away. We had only one hour there. People go there for weeks and months without catching a swordfish. So they all said it was quite useless my going out in the fishing boat which had been provided. 
However, I went out and caught a monster in 20 minutes. <laughs> Winston Churchill in Southern California. Everybody came here. A lot of people hated it. And some people went native and never left. I'm not going to read you anything from Christopher Isherwood, the great British novelist and even greater, I think it's fair to say, British diarist. Anais Nin, another great diarist. She was up in the San Gabriel Mountains. He was in Santa Monica Canyon. They were keeping their diaries every day, and sometimes they actually crossed paths. Sometimes they were kind of jealous of each other. It's like, boy, I bet I'm going to write this one up better than Anais would. Um, then there's that wonderful moment where Susan Sontag goes to a lecture as a teenager to hear Anais Nin speak. Um, the way these people interweave and cross paths and affect each other and get on each other's nerves feels like the city to me. Your mileage may vary, um, but it's my hometown, and to have published this is, is the next best thing to going around the country and buttonholing people and telling them about it. Um, I've got one last photo to show you, and I want to do something that you can't do with everybody in this book, because a lot of people in this book only have one diary entry. This guy has several, and what you get following him over the course of about 15, 20 years is the moment, I think, the elongated but pivotal moment when L.A goes from being one thing to being another. And when he goes from one thing to being another. So I'm just going to start reading with his first impression of the place and anybody who can identify him without a photograph, sing out. So in 1916, he says this, At the summit of the Cajon Pass, our troubles ended. He's driven across the country, he's just topped the rise, he's looking down on the entire Southern California basin, and as with so many, as with the Jode family, for those of you who've read The Grapes of Wrath, looking out over California and the Cajon Pass, it seems perfect. A little later in 1916, it's right in home, you ask when we expect to return. Have rented this house until June 4th, and shall probably stay the limit? I guess I let on, he stays a little beyond the limit. To my surprise, I like it here very much. I do not know when I have been more contented. We have a pretty little place with many flowers and trees and a good lawn. The children are playing out in front now with no wraps. I think he means outerwear, not music with a strong beat. But, um, and wearing socks. There are oodles of writers here, too. 1916, one wouldn't have thought so, if one didn't know better. If I could establish a colony of human beings, it would be a nice place to live permanently. 1919, he's still here. Any guesses yet? It's a little hard to get. This one might give it away, though. Maybe I should skip it and keep it hard. Um, okay, what the hell. We eat and sleep Tarzan. Edgar Rice Burroughs. The dog is named Tarzan. The place is Tarzana. A guy bobbed up day before yesterday with the plan of a whole village he wished to plant in my front yard. School, city hall, banks, business houses, motion picture theater, and it was labeled City of Tarzana, which sounds like a steamboat. A little bit later, picture this. Most of you, I think, have at least been to Los Angeles. The range into which Tarzana runs is very wild. It stretches south of us to the Pacific. We have already seen coyote and deer on the place, and the foreman trapped a bobcat a few weeks ago. Things have come down and carried the kids I assume he means the goats, out of the corral in broad daylight. Deeper in there are mountain lion, 
I bought a couple of 22 caliber rifles for Holbert, that's his son, and myself beside my 25 caliber Remington and automatic. So we're going to do some hunting. Jack, another son, has an air rifle with which he expects to hunt kangaroo rats and lions, and I am going to get them each a pony. There's plenty of room for a golf course and a mighty sporty one, too. Also expect to put in a swimming pool and a tennis court. A little bit later. I never loved any place in my life as I do this. And if anything happens that I don't make a go of it, I believe it would about break my heart. Not the depth of feeling one always associates with Edgar Rice Burroughs, but when you read people's diaries, you get inside their heads just a little bit. Let's take them a little farther. 1924. Formerly, we were way out in the country, while now everything is rapidly moving in our direction. With the exception of one or two tracts, everything between us and Los Angeles has been subdivided. Now, of course, Tarzana is part of Los Angeles. And here he is, a year later, 1925, having had his consciousness, consciousness somewhat raised, sounding really, really contemporary, if you ask me. Almost, I don't know, do you know the word woke? I'm still getting used to it, but listen to this. Among the many things we have done to arouse the hostility and antagonism of Mexicans has been our treatment of them in our fiction, where they are nearly always portrayed as heartless scoundrels. I believe that a policy of consideration and fairness toward our sister republic in our literature would do much to lessen this hostility. Edgar Rice Burroughs. 1929, here he is. A little bone to pick with the Los Angeles Public Library's collection policy. Sorry, Aaron, if you're out there. I'm sure yours are much more enlightened. Books the Los Angeles Public Library believe might contaminate the morals or literary taste of their readers should not be tolerated in Tarzana. And when we consider the fact that some hundred million Tarzan readers all over the world have already been contaminated... We should exert every effort to keep Los Angeles the one bright spot in the literary firmament. <laughs> Actually, my first piece in the Los Angeles Times book review was about their collection policies. And you find these wonderful old slips talking about how books that are now classics could not belong in the collection because they might corrupt young minds. Nineteen thirty one. I planted an acre of potatoes, and as none of them has come up, I'm inclined to think that they were planted upside down <laughs> and are probably making their way slowly to the Antipodes. And then the last three in 1934 come in quick succession. And I'll read them verbatim because I do a little editorializing in the course of including them so as to give the readers a little context. 1934, I'm omitting the dates, but these, it's one of the little subplots that turns up in the book. Ordinarily, you've got the whole breadth of five centuries and change, but sometimes within the course of a week, you'll have something going on on Monday, something going on on Wednesday, something else going on on Thursday from the same person, so that you get, in the case of visitors, uh, an approximation of their stay, or in the case of Edgar Rice Burroughs, one of the more eventful weeks of his life. 1934. Left home at dinner time. That's all he wrote the night he left his wife. A couple days later, came to live at the Garden of Allah, Villa 23. You know the Garden of Allah? 
great old courtyard hotel with a pool rambling across some acreage near Sunset and Laurel Canyon, sadly bulldozed, but its neighbor across the street, the Chateau Marmont, still going strong. And then finally, a day or two later, went to Palm Springs with Florence. <laughs> That's Edgar Rice Burroughs decamping with his mistress, whom he subsequently married. So happy ending, not so much for the first Mrs. Burroughs, but um, that was Edgar. Um, so maybe you've got a slight taste, I hope it's a sweet one, though not without its bitterness, of the breadth of Los Angeles on display in Dear L.A., which, because I don't have to worry about putting it over, because it's already on your laps, which, let me tell you, is one among my many favorite things about the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival. It's not... I'm not singing for my supper, because you guys have already eaten. Um, it's just lovely to look out there and see copies of my books on people's laps and imagine you taking them home and spending a little time with them. Before you do, though, I want to read you just a little bit more from the acknowledgments. And yes, most people don't read from their acknowledgments, but when it's a lot of what you got, you put it in. Libraries have always been my Jerusalem. And if I forget thee, O librarians, may my laptop lose its memory. And I go on to describe some of the librarians who've made this book possible. And I do all the obligatory stuff. I thank my editor who's since been fired, not because of me, I promise. At least that's what he says. Um, and then I say... People think Jewish jokes have been handed down from generation to generation for years. That's not true. I made one up. <laughs> Did you hear the one about the neurotic Jewish author who asks his mother, how'd you like my book? Mom says, meh. You might at least say something nice for your mother in the acknowledgments. And the author says, but mom, I did. Didn't you see where I said all errors are my own? And they are. And finally, to all the diarists, correspondents, and their families, this book is the party I wish I could throw for you. Please drop me a line and at least let me send you a book. And, and remarkably, as I've talked to you back there and gotten to know you just a little bit, um, the last paragraph seems as if it could have been written for most of you. To Angelinos Everywhere. Homesick or still here. I love it. I'd love it if you'd at least consider sharing a personal or family diary entry or a letter with me for possible future publication. And, and boy, was this over my wife's dead body. I give my email address. <laughs> Which I should have made a slide for if you promise not to tell her, but I'll just read it out loud. Kippen, that's my last name, D for David at Gmail. Um, but I actually kind of mean it. I mean, the book's doing okay. They kind of won't shut up about it on NPR, which is nice. Um, they keep writing nice things about it in the paper. You're all going to go and tell 20 of your friends. Um, and I haven't been getting nearly enough emails. And, you know, writers stay at home with a typewriter. Well, not really anymore, but, you know, more or less along those lines. And it's lonely out there. Um, so I'm serious. Either now, if you've got your diaries handy or half-written letters, um, or when you go home and you think about it, I'd love to hear from you. It's not a hardship. It's actually a way of fulfilling my hopes for this book. And those hopes, as much as anything, were to connect with my fellow Angelinos, whether in 1542 or 2019. And then it ends, this pointillist history of Los Angeles has more blind spots than a Camry with a busted mirror. 
Let's fill them in together. There's always the paperback. Good. I was hoping the lights would come up. I told you all to ask me questions, and some of you are actually taking me up on it. It's up to you. Okay. Whoever's closest to you, there we are. First one is, was the hospital Cedars of Lebanon? The hospital was, in fact, Cedars of Lebanon, where my father was a surgeon. And I, little anecdote here, I... On my 50th birthday, no, let me get this right, my wife's 50th birthday because she was in Los Angeles, she was born in Los Angeles, same as me, a year after, um, I took her there, sort of completing a great big circle, and um, we were sort of hanging around outside, we actually took a deep breath and went in and watched the little scary L. Ron Hubbard exhibit, and <laughs> we skulked around the corner to the um, emergency, what had been the emergency uh, entrance where, you know, the ambulances used to arrive. We're sort of, you know, eyeballing it. Some guy comes by, nice looking guy, friendly as the day is long, says, um, you were born here, weren't you? <laughs> and actually we both were, but it was her birthday, but we were both born, who, for all we know, in the same delivery room. He says, you want to come up, you want to see? Nobody knew we were there. If we never came out of the building, <laughs> nobody would be the wiser. But we took a breath and we said, sure. So he lets us in, uh, ushers us into a rather claustrophobically small elevator, takes us upstairs to, I don't know, I think the third floor. We walk out and there's no mistaking it. You walk down the hall and there is the widest, longest window indoors you'd ever see in a million years because that was the delivery room. You know, people would tap the glass and for all I know, my mom, my dad, hey, David, you're in there. Welcome to the world. And then he lets us in. And it's a totally anticlimactic story because we were not apprehended and never seen again, as you know. Um, and we did not break out in hives because we had finally completed this circle um, of Los Angeles that brought us back to where we began. But I looked out the window, because there's a window on the other side that actually enables you to see the city, at what must have been, I guess, the same view, with exceptions, but a similar view to the one I first beheld. And to look out over it, I'm making this up as I go along, but to look out over it and see the city like that. And it was a fairly clear day. You know, the ocean is just enough there that even if it's not there, you can convince yourself that it is. And I thought I was in love with L.A. already, but as if you couldn't tell, um, I was in love with L.A. a little bit more. And the more I worked on this book, and like I say, it was seven years, um, and the more terrible things I read about the place, somehow the deeper I got to know it, it's like a person. It's like somebody, like a member of your family, however infuriating it is. It's yours and nobody else's, or they have their own and you have yours. Um, so if I spend this long answering every question, we're going to be here a long time, but thank you for asking that one. Well, thank you for the answer, because I never saw that room other than when I was a wee one, <laughs> as I was born there, too. It's still there. If you tell me before you go inside so that I know to come get you if they're not as nice to you as you were to me, I encourage you to go see it. And I encourage everybody to go back to their natal room. Who wouldn't want to? Wow. Um, anyway. Uh, My other question yeah. is on the cover of your book, which mm -hmm. interchange is that? That is, I don't know if anybody's seen, what's the movie, um, uh, La La Land? That is the towering intersection from which you can see that amazing view. And Lord, thank uh, Modern Library for using this photograph. Um, it's the 105, which wasn't there when we were born, and the 110, and the Green Line light rail. And it's quite spectacular. I encourage you all to 
ride the curve, preferably with somebody else driving. Another question. Um, we have family connections with theaters as well. I mean, ah. My three sons were all born there. Mm -hmm. Other members of the family were doctors there, etc. But I grew up in Santa Monica, California. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know if you have any special stories about Santa Monica. Oh, wow. Um, I mentioned Christopher Isherwood, who lived uh, a lot of his life in Santa Monica. And he certainly has some wonderful stories, including one about the Bel Air fire. Were you in LA for the Bel Air fire? Absolutely harrowing. And you know, I won't insult you and take up precious time, and I'm having such fun now, I kind of wish I'd take that, taken up a little less of it talking, so I could have spent more of it talking with you. But there is an index to this book. And Santa Monica has, let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve entries. Oh, um, yes, you can get it on Amazon.com. You can get it on Pals.com if you have an allergy to Amazon.com, which some people do. Um, but yeah, that would thrill me. And like I say, if any of you feel left out, not only not having a book, but not having an inscribed book, you, against my better judgment and my wife's wishes, have a way of contacting me. Another question. Uh, which high school did you go to? I already admitted it to one person and he made a face. I went to Beverly. I went to Beverly Hills High School. <laughs> yeah, I know. All the Hamiltons out there and the Fairfax Highs are grumbling. <laughs> now, where'd you go to high school? Fairfax. Fairfax, yeah, I figured. Ask another one. I moved out here uh, from the East Coast. I've been here for five years. And Raise your hand so I can see you. I moved ah. out um, to be near my son. He mm -hmm. lives in L.A. You should have made him. Yeah, okay. Yeah, good. Yeah, he, he lives He's in L.A. For good. Years, and I just want to say something really fun. I think it's cute. You don't never set that up. Now you've <laughs> oh. got this bar to reach. But okay, okay. give it a well, try. Uh, probably about 15, 20 years mm -hmm. ago, we were standing in Santa Monica near the ocean. And I said, and he's my only child. And I said, do you like it out here? And he goes, what's not to like? Well, of course not. <laughs> There's a wonderful moment in... But go ahead. no great pizza. I'm sorry. No New York pizza. <laughs> See me after class. <laughs> I had to work really hard to keep this book from being way too much of the 30s. Yes, exactly. Because that's when... I mean, I'm writing a piece right now. I don't know, have any of you seen Alta magazine yet? It's this quarterly magazine, great big thing that Will Hurst's grandson, William Randolph Hurst, the big baby that uh, Churchill writes about, has started publishing out of San Francisco. And I'm writing something about Musso and Frank's. If anybody has any memories of Musso and Frank's restaurant on Hollywood Boulevard, definitely come up and tell me or email me or both because I need to feed 1,500 words about the 100th anniversary of Musso and Frank. Um, so, um, it remind me of the question, I apologize. I, I'm supposed to repeat them for other people, but I should repeat them for myself. My favorite era, hands down, the 30s, but there have been revelations. I mean, one of the reasons I assigned myself this book, not knowing it was going to be a seven-year uh, uh, baton death march, was <laughs> that I knew I didn't know enough about the previous centuries. I didn't want to be a prisoner of my own century. And I met this wonderful kid, Francisco P. Ramirez from the 1850s, who was translating the front page of the first newspaper in Los Angeles from English into Spanish on its own back page and into French inside and was this amazing journalistic prodigy who ought to have journalism schools named after him. All those kind of things. So yeah, 1930s are probably first, but they're first among equals now. Yeah. Is there any film that uh, you think does a good job oh. of portraying L.A. in, I'm talking about a little historical. Yeah. Um, well, of course, the obvious choices for great L.A. movies are Chinatown and Blade Runner and, uh, you know, a lot of great film noir like The Big Sleep, although that was mostly shot on a back lot, so it's not like you can get great vistas of the place. Um, I would be really curious, to, what would your nomination be? 
L.A. Confidential, wonderful movie, almost kind of in conversation with Chinatown, down to the very soundtrack. Have you got one? You're stumped. Okay. Um, let me just throw one other one at you because no, you're never going to hear it from anybody else. And I never want to see it again because I'm afraid I won't love it as much as I did the first time. 1941 is a very good, funny movie, and I would see that again in a heartbeat. I strongly suspect that Volcano... Oh, it's does, yes? Was I right? Maybe I should see it again. Yes, yes, but not even just for the destruction of the Beverly Center. Check it out. Again, email me. Let me know whether I was completely on a sugar high that day. Thank you for the question. Yes? Hi, I just would like to ask you four, if you have any of um, letters from four, sometimes Angelinos in there. One is Joan Didion, Thomas Mann, Stravinsky, and John Cage. <sighs> Not everybody knows John Cage was here. I was really worried because you started with Joan Didion, and sadly, shamefully, there is no Joan Didion in the book, and believe me, it's not because I didn't look. Her best writing went into what she published, and we're all very, very thankful for it. But from Thomas Mann, there's a letter he wrote to FDR um, begging him to accept more Jewish refugees. From Stravinsky... And not only from him, but from Robert Kraft, his biographer, um, there are wonderful reminiscences of, um, let me think. Uh, well, actually, here's what I'll do. In the interest of time, there is a diary entry here from John Cage when he was a teenager, because, you know, his mom was the society columnist for the Los Angeles Times. John Cage, avant-garde composer, four minutes, 33 seconds of silence. Um, John Cage writes about hearing a concert at the Hollywood Bowl and being transported by Stravinsky's The Firebird. Yeah. So yes, three out of four ain't bad. Another question? Hi, I find your information very enjoyable, but I got here about two minutes late, so I may have missed something. What are the odds? <laughs> <laughs> but I have a question in, in writing description of your speaking here. Yeah. It mentions Boyle Heights, which you found. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, my husband grew up and my mother grew up. Well, you'll have to ask your husband and your mom. Away. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know a company called Snyder Diamond? Snyder Diamond, yes. He's the founder of that, so his history is... In Plumbing, right? Exactly. Do you know who lived in the building that is now Snyder Diamond in Ladera Heights? The great screenwriter, among others, of The Big Sleep, which we just mentioned, alongside William Firthman, uh, William Faulkner, Jules Firthman, it's his house. There's a plaque in it, and now it's the home of a great plumbing supply store. Sorry. Um, this building here, I'm hesitant because I, there's like a phantom umbilicus behind me that I just know I'm going to disrupt. This building here is the Boyle Hotel. It's built, anybody recognize it? First and Boyle, facing west past downtown, which it was not doing, or if it was, it was not this particular skyline in 1889 when it was built. I live, by the way, in a converted hotel in Pasadena called the Castle Green that was built in 1898, so I basically take a train from 1898 to 1889 to get to my nonprofit lending library. This that? is Libro Schmibros. I got home in 2010 from being director of literature of the National Endowment for the Arts, did not know what I was going to do. Um, I had knocked on doors to get a president elected who had picked somebody to run the NEA for whom writing was a lot less of a priority than for his predecessor. And, but I had been a book critic. I had been the book critic for the San Francisco Chronicle. I had been a book collector all my life. I had via, among other things, going to public libraries on Saturday mornings for their book sales, and also having publishers send me books without me even asking for them, best job in the world, um, amassed a collection of like 10,000 books. And literally a month after I got there, to Boyle Heights, because I'd had family live there, but I grew up on the west side, just because I'm a transit geek and I got on the gold line because for the first time it was running to Boyle Heights, and I fell in love with this walkable neighborhood that, you know, is, is, you know, you could run half a dozen errands in an hour and not have to get in a car. And, 
not have to visit a chain establishment. So I fell for this place. I rented, improvised this nowhere near up to code kind of loft. And the next thing I knew, the library down the street, the Ben Franklin Library, the oldest branch library in the system because that's where the mule car line used to stop. Um, that library announced that it was closing on Mondays for the first time in its history because of budget cuts. You can tell libraries mean a lot to me. So I ran around and got a bunch of shelves and um, wanted to come up with a name that sort of paid tribute to the old Jewish Boyle Heights, but also the current mostly Mexican-American Boyle Heights. So I called it Libro Schmibros. <laughs> See, this is an audience that gets that. Um, and it started out in that shoebox. It moved to a storefront on Mariachi Plaza, which is this great square where the mariachis hang out waiting for somebody to pull up to the curb and ask them to play a bar mitzvah. And then it moved across the street to the Boyle Hotel, and it's right here. And it would make me kvel. It would make me very happy if you would come to see Libro Shmibros, because we put books into people's hands now, five days a week, from noon until six, and it's the apple of my eye. It, it's, uh, it's a nonprofit. What's that? Well, Thank you. Oh, well of course. Uh, you know I can't keep Libro Shmibros to myself. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Well, okay.